And in, in, the, in the book, you tell a terrific story about the, um, the change from the way uh, initially, you know, um, Humvees would be cruising down the street with three inch thick windows and terrifying the locals um, to foot patrols. And you tell a story about you and uh, General Petraeus going on a foot patrol with a bunch of others um, at a crowd gathering. Just tell that story because it's such a great example of the changed approach. Yeah, well, I mean, an Iraqi insurgent who I had spoke to during the tribal awakening in Sahawa said to me, you know what, we spent the first year trying to separate you from the Iraqi people, and we did that with the IED, the roadside bomb, because we, um, we knew that if we hit you with enough bombs, you would get inside the vehicles and not get out and talk to Iraqis. Once we'd separated you, we spent the next year trying to separate Shia from Sunni. And once we achieved that, we could start the civil war. And I think that that's kind of how it played out. Um, what we had to do at the start of the surge was to break that. And guys were driving around in the, what we used to call urban submarines. You know, you'd look at the little, little Iraqi fish swimming by and they couldn't even see you. And you'd get out with your sunglasses on and you'd be you know, looking like an imperial stormtrooper. And more importantly, people wouldn't see you more than once. You just drive by shooting, basically. Um, and so we had to completely change that. And the way that we did it was to create these joint security stations out on the ground, which had an Iraqi police, Iraqi military, and US uh, or coalition military presence, so that people were actually living in their district um, and uh, walking out on the ground um, in a way that they could negotiate and interact with the population. Um, a lot of guys found that really scary. You know, um, I worked with one unit that had been uh, up at Taji, which is where um, Michael was um, located later, later on. Uh, and those guys had lost um, a couple of dozen people getting into and out of the city every morning, commuting to the fight, um, just losing people to roadside bombs. And we finally came to them and said, we've got a better way to do it. Get out of the vehicle, we're going to walk around, we're going to engage with the Iraqis. And they're like, what, are you crazy? You know, because it just seemed, it was counterintuitive. It seemed a lot more dangerous. When we finally did get out, their casualties dropped to next to nothing. They lost one guy in the rest of their tour because they finally got a position where the Iraqis could treat them as someone they could do business with and the way that you see, you know, as General McChrystal, who's the commander in Afghanistan, says now, the way to defeat roadside bombs is not to shoot the bomber, it's to convince the community to tell you where the bomb is. Mm. Um, and that's what we managed to do uh, in, in the second half of the t surge. But to make that happen, we had to get out on the ground and show them that it was possible. So Petraeus was out every day on the ground, and I was out with him, uh, working with units, trying to convince them that we could do it better. And on this one occasion, he was eating an ice cream, talking to an Iraqi standing next to a car, and this big crowd of kids gathered. Um, and I was getting very, very nervous. There was a big difference between the Shia groups and the Sunni groups in Iraq. Partly it was a matter of theology, but it was also a matter of tactics. Um, you'd be driving down the road in a Shia district and suddenly uh, traffic would disappear and you'd see women grabbing their kids and pulling them inside the house and you'd know you're about to get hit. And I can remember driving down the street and this happening and going, shit, pull over. And you'd pull over just in time and huge car bomb. And this is the, the way that the Shia groups like Daesh al Mahdi did business. The Sunnis would just rock and roll in a street full of children. Um, different approach, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda guys. Um, and I've seen them do absolutely horrendous things too their own people, their own children, uh, just for the sake of killing one American. Um, and so here we were in a Sunni district surrounded by kids, and I was like, you know, we're going to get hit here, and, and 40 children are going to get killed. Um, so um, the way that we would have done it in the past would have been in vehicles, we would have swept these kids out of the way and driven through, and, you know, uh, instead on this occasion, I bought a soccer ball from a stall, and we started playing soccer, uh, and General Petraeus took his helmet off, and we started kicking the ball around with the children, and we managed to kick it far enough that they... <laughs> basically ran off the street after it, and then we disappeared. So, you know, it um, sounds kind of simple, but um, that, was, that was him setting an example for the troops on the ground. And once they finally figured out that it was actually safer to show the Iraqis some respect, uh, we didn't, they all got religion and we started doing it, and, and the thing turned around pretty quickly. Well, now, another of the um, notorious things to come out of the uh, conflict in Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq is the uh, suggestion that the torture has been used. And I know that the Bush administration had a fairly flexible definition of torture so as to keep themselves on the right side of the line as they saw it, but waterboarding um, is either torture or, in your view, attempted murder, and we know that that was used. Now, here's, here's a hypothetical problem. Let's suppose um, you're in Iraq and you've taken a guy who clearly knows a lot about stuff that's happening, 
Uh, and um, President Obama is about to make a flying visit to Iraq. And this guy knows, because he's told you, that uh, there will be uh, a, an, an attempt on Obama's life, and he has the details, but he won't tell you. The question is, will you torture him in order to find the details in order to protect the life of President Obama? Absolutely not. Um, I think, that, you know, I've, I've worked through in the field and also in theory, this whole so-called ticking mom scenario. You know, if, if that's the real situation, you tell the president to call the visit off or he goes to a different airport. Or, you know, it's, it's actually pretty simple to, to reroute a presidential motorcade. You know, it's not that difficult. Um, but let's, let's take it to the absolute hypothetical extreme of the ticking bomb scenario where the terrorist knows where the bomb is and when it's going to go off. Um, even under those circumstances, I don't think that it's, it's a valid uh, situation to be, t to be torturing someone. Why? Because terrorism is an existential threat to societies, but it's not an existential threat in the sense that the terrorists can destroy societies. It's an existential threat in the sense that the terrorists can make us do things that stop us from being ourselves. And they can, you can actually destroy society within mm. by the way you react, you react to terrorism. And so let's take it even to a further extreme of it. The terrorist has a nuclear weapon and they're going to set it off in a city, let's say a city in America. If terrorists were to set off a nuclear weapon in a city in America, it wouldn't destroy America. It would be terrible. You know, a million people might die. It would be absolutely horrendous. You would do almost anything to avoid that happening. But if you torture someone in order to prevent that, that ultimately destroys America. Because America is not just a bunch of cities and a coastline. It's, it's a whole democratic way of life founded on principles from the 18th century of the Enlightenment, of the rule of law and limited government and a government that governs by the consent of its people. And torturing people ultimately takes you down a completely different path. Mm. And it doesn't stop there. You know, you do it once, you know, who's to say it's not going to come up again? So, you know, both as a practical matter and as a, an ethical issue for people that live in a democracy, I just don't think there's any circumstance in which it makes more sense to torture the guy then just change your plans or try to, mm. you know, to avoid the thing happening. I think it was last year or the year before Darius Rajali published a very big book called Torture and Democracy in which he makes a very convincing case that as a matter of practicality, torture uh, does not produce effective, accurate, reliable intelligence. Um, but of course the, the ethical dimension of it was dealt with in a, a case in the House of Lords in England, I think two or three years ago, the uh, British Parliament had passed a law which provided for the indefinite incarceration of people who were suspected terrorists or terrorist threats, but not people who could be charged with anything because there wasn't any evidence that they'd done anything wrong, but they couldn't be removed from the country because to do so would return them to a place where they would be uh, uh, tortured or killed. And by a, 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 an overwhelming majority, I think there's only one dissent, the House of Lords said that the, um, uh, the threat to democracy does not lie with the terrorists, but in laws like those. And that's really a sort of judicial endorsement of your theory. And of course, if you're looking at the ends that you achieve by torturing, it may or may not be reliable intelligence, but it will also be a fundamental change in the, in the character of the society that you're seeking to defend. Right. And, <coughs> excuse me. Taking it from one end of the spectrum to the other, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much any set of counter-terrorism security measures can have a very damaging effect on society and on the campaign against terrorism if you don't look at them in a broader context of the political discourse. So let's talk about um, airline security measures. Mm. You know, um, every time you go through an airline uh, metal detector now, you've got to take your shoes off. It's the Richard Reed Memorial, you know, shoe removal because of the, because of the, the shoe bombing. There's about 100 million people go through airports in a day around the world. That's 100 million people that at some level of their mind, at some moment, are thinking about Al-Qaeda. You know, it's free advertising for Al-Qaeda. 100 million people every day. And it also sends the message, we, the government, think that Al-Qaeda is such an important threat that we're putting in place all these very expensive and draconian security measures. And it pumps them up to a level where they probably wouldn't be without all those, um, those measures. And I think that one of the principles which you have learned in, in the counterinsurgency world is you have to make security measures as 
transparent as possible to the population so they don't disrupt people's daily lives and they don't have cause to remind people all the time that there's a terrorist threat out there. Getting the environment back to normal as quickly as possible is how you rob the oxygen from the terrorists' political agenda. Um, and again, that's one of the things we try to do in Iraq. We try to get back to normality. We try to treat it as a stabilization operation. That's again what we're trying to do now in Afghanistan. We're trying to get it away from this heightened level of um, uh, uncertainty and threat to try and return as much of the environment to normal as we possibly can. There's a risk inherent in that, um, but it's outweighed, I think, by the risk of uh, essentially transforming society into something else. Mm. Now, this is not a risk that's uh, just confined to terrorism. I mean, in conventional warfare, you have the same risk, that you'll take actions to defeat an enemy that will actually change who you are fundamentally. Um, and that gets us back to sort of the start of the discussion. You can argue about the, the legalities and the rights and wrongs of a specific action, but I think in general terms, the enemy might be different and the form of warfare might be different, but we're still us. You know, we're still a nation state founded on democracy and the rule of law, and we have to act in accordance with who we are. Otherwise, at some level, um, we're going to lose, even if, even if we defeat the terrorists. I have to say, for a few years there, it was debatable whether you could have said that about America, although it seems to be writing itself now. Well, I think, um, you know, this is not something that's confined to the United States. Every national government in the world has had the same set of issues to deal with, and I think a lot of them, some in Europe and the UK, for example, have dealt with it in at least as damaging a way um, as, as the Bush administration did. And I think that um, we've certainly seen, uh, you know, the, the true nature of America as, in terms of what's happened in the last uh, eight or nine months as things have reoriented. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I have enormous faith in the capacity of the United States to self-heal, to self-correct. We all make mistakes, and Americans aren't a thousand times smarter than everybody else, even though they're a thousand times bigger. And so, Amer you know, America's mistakes tend to be more obvious than some other, other people's. But the fact is, you know, it's a system of democracy that rapidly writes itself. Um, and that, to me, is one of the greatest strengths of societies like Australia and the United States and other democracies, that, yeah, like every other country, we make mistakes. But unlike, say, Iran or North Korea, um, where crazy economic theories are uncorrectable, you know, um, you, you have a system which heals itself. Now, that's probably a good time to invite questions from the audience. There are two roving microphones, so if you can indicate uh, whether you have a question. Hello. The search strategy in Afghanistan seems to be based on liberal principles of approach of, uh, on the tactical level of hearts and minds to win over tribal leaders, but on a strategic level, there seems to be a realist approach of talking to the Taliban, which can, you know, intuitively undermines the first approach. So how do we, overcome, how do we bridge this gap um, in an ethical way? Well, I think the gap is actually more apparent than real. Um, the, the strategy is actually not to win over tribal leaders uh, at the tactical level. The, um, in fact, throughout most of Afghanistan, the tribal structure is very heavily eroded to the point where in most of the south and the east, uh, tribal uh, authorities have been so badly uh, compromised and, and dis disrupted by the Taliban that it's actually the Taliban who are in charge in a lot of cases. Um, what we're trying to do is to step back from some of the policies that were alienating the population and try to work on issues like governance uh, and corruption to try to put in place um, legitimate local authorities. And in most cases, they probably won't be tribal. They'll be more sort of local district-based. In terms of the Taliban, there isn't any suggestion from uh, any of the partners to ISAF that we're going to be negotiating with the Taliban senior leadership right now. Um, and in fact, there was an attempt at negotiation last year between the Afghan government uh, and Mullah Omar's representatives, which totally broke down because the two sides were negotiating at cross purposes. Um, the way that negotiation works in a counterinsurgency environment is very much like what happened in the Good Friday Accords, which was the negotiated settlement that ended the war in Northern Ireland. It's where you essentially fight the enemy to the point where they realise that they can gain more politically by negotiating than by continuing to fight. And then the solution that you get to is essentially one where the insurgents agree to lay down the weapon and swear off terrorism and insurgency in return for a seat at the table and being part of the political process. Uh, there are a lot of subordinate level Taliban, so-called Taliban commanders, uh, and a lot of local groups 
that are fighting sort of aligned with the Taliban who uh, under certain circumstances are likely to reconcile. But we still have to do some pretty heavy fighting, I would say at least one or two years of pretty robust military operations in Afghanistan to get people to the point where the enemy sees it as more in their interests to negotiate than just keep fighting. Um, so uh, the ethics of that um, essentially are about protecting the population. Uh, you've got to make people feel safe and you have to protect them against all comers, both the enemy and us. And one of the first things that General McChrystal did, did when he was given command was to ban the use of airstrikes against civilian targets, which has been uh, an incredible source of angst and of civilian casualties for years in Afghanistan. And he, within a week of turning up, he, he changed that policy uh, straight away. And we're trying to um, regain that partnership that we once had with Afghans. And um, the hope is that by doing that and also marginalizing the enemy, we can get people to a point where uh, they see it as being in their best interests to uh, walk away from the Taliban. What happens to Mullah Omar? That's a separate question. And uh, uh, like Osama bin Laden, I don't think there's much point in trying to kill the guy, frankly. Um, he will eventually uh, either surrender or die of old age somewhere in Pakistan. You know, and that's, that's what typically tends to happen to these guys. Um, and that's okay. If we can end the war in Afghanistan, uh, killing or not killing one guy is kind of a secondary issue. It's interesting that it, ma it matches the rules of chess quite neatly. <laughs> chess is a Persian game, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Quite. Check, checkmate is or based on Farsi Shah, for Shah Mart, dead yeah, kill, yeah, dead yeah. king. Yeah. The king dies. Uh, it's, it's actually not... I don't think you're allowed to play chess in, in Iran anymore, are you? I don't know. They've oh, gone through some, right? some changes recently. Anyway, sorry, there was another question, I think. Uh, fr from, the, from the discussion, it seems to me that the... If, if we take the, the, the question posed tonight, does the uh, means justify the end, I've heard nothing in the discussion which, su which suggests that it doesn't. Uh, it seems that, th that the discussion is more uh, that one needs to be clear about what the end is and that the end might be more than the immediate short-term end. One has to consider other competing uh, strategic ends. But so far as I can tell from, from the discussion, if the question is does the end justify the means, the answer is yes. Um, I, I would have thought the answer was, I mean, you, you need to develop that, but. Um, you know, the most um, obvious end to be achieved in one of these um, hypothetical examples was to save the life of President Obama uh, and to do so by torturing a person who's been taken captive. Um, the difficulty uh, with that, I mean, it's, it's well, I'll lay, I guess, a, an atom bomb in an American city or in Melbourne, for that matter, uh, might be another difficult one to test. But if the end includes as an unintended consequence a complete departure from uh, the from the nature of your society then that's an end that uh, will not justify the means that you've used the problem is that using the means that we predicate uh, actually adds to the ends in such a way that you get unintended consequences that are unjustifiable on any view that's the difficult, and I think I, I really think it's difficult to think of any plausible argument that says that the end justifies the means, unless the means are just venial sins. In which case, I suppose pretty much everyone thinks it's okay to save someone's feelings by telling a white lie. But you know, that's a rather different end of the spectrum from what we've been discussing. Mm. I think I go back to what I said at the start. There are some means that are beyond the pale and mm. just cannot be used. Yep. Um, otherwise, we cease to be who we are. Um, and so therefore, in general terms, philosophical terms, the answer is no, the end does not justify the means. In practice, um, it's always a question of what kind of end are you talking about? What sort of means are you discussing? And how are you going to, um, uh, to balance those against each other? As an example, we went into Iraq and you know, three to 3,500 Iraqi lives are being lost every week. We had to do that process of of peace building to save those lives and yet we had al-Qaeda cells out there attacking us and you know killing children killing us um, beheading people trying to stop that process we had to kill some al-Qaeda guys to make that process work and we did have to kill a pretty substantial number of al-Qaeda terrorists in order to save all those other lives um, and those sort of decisions that are, that are made in wartime are never easy but if I was going to do it again I think I'd probably come to the same conclusion that 3,000 innocent civilians are worth the loss of 10 to 20 um, you know, radical assholes in their village. Um, 
but you know, it's, it's not just a black and white. You've got to make those decisions uh, as you go. Yeah. Is it working? Uh, hello. After September 11, uh, Bush had, uh, had the support of the whole, even the whole parties in America, for his crusade. And that was, uh, the end here is sensible and justified. But he imposed another end, which doesn't make sense at that time. The timing is Iraq. Why did he involve Iraq at that time? Uh, though the end is justified maybe after the invasion of Kuwait, but after uh, September 11, it doesn't make sense I mean, for everybody uh, because here the, the end is not justified. It's personal because it's maybe he wanted to achieve the objective or the, the wish of his dad, you know, uh, George Bush, because he wanted to maybe to take revenge of the Saddam who expressed the hatred of America of, and of Bush. But to impose that in the whole crusade, which all people sympathized with after some September 11, made the, inv made the invasion of Iraq, I mean, um, you know, accepted that kind of uh, objection throughout the whole world. Maybe after Kuwait, after the invasion of Kuwait, the end of invasion Iraq maybe will be justified. So uh, here, do you think the end is justified by the means of invasion Iraq and impose it uh, with the September 11 uh, crusade? Well, this is another example of the practical difficulty of a question like, does the ends justify the means? Because at the time of the decision to invade Iraq, I do think that most Western political leaders genuinely, but both those that supported the idea of the war and those that opposed it, genuinely believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Um, and was supporting terrorism and might continue to do so. And they also believe that the means that is invading Iraq would be relatively swift, not involve a lot of civilian casualties, be over quickly and not cost a lot of money. So the, th the, the calculation that was being made was uh, the end is you know, based on him having weapons of mass destruction and supporting terrorists and the, um, the means are swift, relatively bloodless. And of course both those things turned out to be wrong. Um, and this is the sort of practical matter of trying to act on these kinds of questions. The quality of your intelligence is never perfect. And the judgments that you make are always made on partial uh, and incomplete information. And they're often wrong. And I think that's one of the reasons why having sort of hard and fast black and white rules uh, just doesn't necessarily work here. You have to go through a process of reasoning. Um, and most of us who did go through that process of reasoning, particularly the US State Department, um, uh, those of us in the intel community and the, and the counterinsurgency community were pretty unanimously against the idea um, of invading Iraq. Uh, but, uh, you know, the way that it works in a democracy is when uh, properly elected uh, civilian leaders make a decision uh, to go to war, then the way the legal system works is you do have to go uh, and carry that out. And I think that's, uh, again, one of the issues with intelligence in this process. The, the more accurate your intelligence is, the finer your judgments can be. Um, it's very rare in my experience that you have good enough intelligence to make those kind of judgments. Imagine yourself in Berlin in August 1939, and you've got the opportunity of taking out Hitler with one bullet. Would you do it? It would be murder. I, I don't think you do, frankly. Yeah. I mean, that might be contentious too. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't think... Actually, I, don't I, see, might, I might I, I don't see how you can one. say. I don't see how you can say okay. in August 1939... Um, you, you know, that, that you would do that. Um, I, I do think it would be murder, um, and I think it would be murder to kill Osama bin Laden on the street in Melbourne. Mm. And in both cases, I think if you're going to be consistent ethically, you have to say, you know, there's a way to deal with this, and it isn't shooting the guy in the head. Mm. It's um, interesting. Having said that, put Hitler on a battlefield. Yeah. Different question. Yeah. Okay. We've got time for one last question. Um, we've heard... Uh, tonight that America is a democracy which constantly is reinventing itself and that's one of its strengths and it's seen the light on torture and uh, on, uh, you know, on bombing people from the air and all that kind of stuff. Can you speak but up a little? We've heard uh, tonight that uh, the United States is a democracy that keeps reinventing itself, uh, that it's seen the light on torture and on a whole bunch of other discredited strategies. But I'm wondering how much the new administration really has changed the equation because there are still unmanned drones flying over Pakistan killing civilians and the Obama administration has still said that it's going to continue the policy of subcontracting torture to some of the most uh, 
you know, undemocratic and awful regimes on the planet, um, and it's going to allow extraordinary rendition. Um, that is, it's going to allow other people to do the, the dirty work that it refuses or that, that, that it would like, to see, would like to do but can't because, you know, it just won't. Um, so I wonder really how much has America learned and how much has it really changed? And I say that as someone who would rather see a world ruled by the Americans than by China. Hmm. Well, I, I actually think that there has been a huge amount of learning and change uh, in the US process, but I don't think it's as simply a change from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. The really sharp change of direction in US foreign policy uh, happened at the end of the first George W. Bush term, and there was a very significant difference in US foreign policy in the first Bush term and the second Bush term. There's actually quite a high degree of policy continuity between the second Bush term and the Obama administration. And in fact, the strategy that the Obama administration is executing on the ground in Afghanistan was designed in the Bush White House uh, in 2008. So there's actually a high degree of continuity. One of my lessons watching this whole thing is that um, diplomacy is not like engineering. It's a lot more like dating, you know? Um, the, it, it, matters who makes, it matters who makes the pitch. It matters who says the words. It's not just what the policy settings are and you tinker with those and you get them right and you get a certain result. There's much more sort of fingertip feel and alchemy to it and it's about relationships. Um, and any good diplomat in the world knows that. And I think that's one of the things that um, uh, the Obama administration is dealing with now where symbolically it's extremely different um, to be um, Barack Obama and to make statements about what's going to happen in Afghanistan because you don't have a hanging over you issues like Abu Ghraib and weapons of mass destruction and the invasion of Iraq and all those other things and there's been a line drawn in the sand and again this is why there's an enormous amount of strength in democratic systems and I would include Australia as well as the United States um, where there's a peaceful transition of power from one party to another on, on a regular basis and you can rule a line under what's happened in the past and deal with issues and move forward. And that's something that democracies can do, uh, that dictatorships and uh, monarchies of some kinds and, and other forms of, of uh, government can't. Uh, and I think it, it's not a sign of weakness when that happens, it's actually uh, a sign of strength. That's all we have time for. We're instructed to stick to time as best we can. In closing, can I again thank Michael Thurston for his sponsorship uh, of tonight's event and express the hope that the uh, US administration's views continue to be influenced by your views. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.